Even before a game console gets officially announced, gamers and media alike will catch rumors about the next piece of hardware via codenames. Sometimes they pertain to the systems themselves or components contained within. By name alone, silicon can be elevated to legendary status. The PlayStation 3 cell broadband engine is perhaps the greatest example of this practice. When Sony publicly first announced the PlayStation 3 at E3 2005, the cell was heralded by Sony and its IBM co-creator as the next big thing in processor design, with revolutionary levels of performance needed to deliver HD-era experiences. Despite a full year before the PS3's launch, the press and gamers alike would get drawn into the promises that Cell was slated to deliver. On the contrary, Microsoft's PR strategy for the upcoming Xbox 360 did not invest much time on individual components, as much as it was selling the entire experience as a whole. While hardware codenames did exist, the software side of the equation would take center stage. There they would focus on games and of course Xbox Live. However, it's not to be understated how important the Xbox 360's hardware was for delivering Microsoft's promises. The Xbox 360 had 512 megabytes of GDDR3 memory, a revolutionary new ATI-developed GPU called Xenos, and at its heart an IBM-developed triple-core processor that was configured to deliver a breadth of new possibilities for a new generation. It was codenamed Xenon. The history of the Xenon processor ironically starts with that of the Cell processor, where pseudo-industrial espionage is the name of the game. IBM would have its hands in all three honeypots of the 7th generation, with some common technology being found across all three systems. Specifically, it's the main processors in the HD Twins that share a common lineage, and not just in their PowerPC instruction set compatibility. In 2001, Sony, Toshiba, and IBM came together to design the Cell Broadband Processor in the vision of Sony's Ken Kutaragi, the man who initially pushed Sony to enter the console business in the first place. Designed for streaming and manipulating data with a field of independent SIMD vector engines, called the Synergistic Processing Elements, or SBEs, the Cell could achieve floating point performance multitudes higher than traditional processors of the time. In this manner, the cell was well equipped to handle a massive scope of graphics, physics, and a host of other processes entirely dependent on this floating point capability. As great as the SPEs were, they could not get by entirely on their own, as they did lack some features found in more traditional processors. To lead the SPEs, IBM developed the power processing element to act as the cell's command core. In contrast to the SPEs, the Power Processing Element, or PPE, was a full-featured PowerPC compatible core leveraging some design tools used for the PowerPC 7400. The PPE, in essence, is a very stripped-down, dual-issue, in-order PowerPC core. Contained within it is a deep 21-stage pipeline designed for high clock speed. Importantly, it could run dual processing threads and house a vector SIMD processor of its own called the VMX unit. Better known as the Velocity Engine to Apple users, the VMX unit is an SIMD vector processor that's built into many PowerPC chips starting with the PowerPC 7400. Older Apple users know that processor as the G4. Using the Altavec instruction set, the VMX unit could crunch through math-heavy processes like video encoding. This coupled to the G4's very short pipeline meant it could often beat Pentium 4s that were much higher clock. At a Pentium 4-like speed of 3.2GHz, the VMX unit would prove to be quite the weapon. The PPE as a full CPU core would be a sense of familiarity for new cell processor developers, but more importantly was there because the SPEs needed it. The PPE was a full processing core within a fairly small footprint, had a high potential clock speed, low power consumption, and that all-important VMX unit. Which leads us back to what Microsoft was up to by the time the STI consortium was finalizing the cell design in 2003. Midway through the original Xbox's life, its particular implementation of the Pentium 3 was the source of some bad blood between Microsoft and Intel. The latter retained full control over the design and supply of chips, precluding Microsoft from developing revised versions at smaller process nodes and lower cost. It was a problem Microsoft sought to avoid a second time around, Hence, they commissioned IBM to design a new processor that Microsoft would retain full rights over. So what did IBM do? 
Will they leverage the work they did with Sony and Toshiba on the cell by offering the PPE core to Microsoft? Being so small, more than one PPE could be packed onto a reasonably sized CPU die along with a decent sized L2 cache. The high 3.2 GHz clock speed, the dual multi-threads per core, and the all-important VMX unit were attractive for a gaming console, where vector performance was a premium, yet it still had a reasonable semblance of features found on more traditional CPU cores, unlike the cell with its all-vector or almost-nothing approach. Microsoft was also focused on how SIMD vector performance could enhance or complement memory-saving techniques on this new machine, notably via dynamic streaming and procedural generation. This was before Microsoft's doubling of the 360's memory to 512 megabytes, so memory management was a must. To enhance the VMX unit for this process, it was modified to allow concurrent access by both processing threads on each PPE core, using two lengthened sets of registers and a customized set of Altavec instructions. This is where the Xenon's form of PPE sets itself from the cell processors, where cell mostly uses its SPEs to handle the brunt of number crunching under the direction of its main PPE core, the Xenon's three PPEs became the heavy lifters and retained the benefit of being complete processing cores, each with independent operation. Each had their own load store unit, integer unit, and a branch predictor as found on any general CPU core. The cell's SPEs, for instance, did not have a branch predictor and were totally reliant on the PPE core to handle that problem. Both the cell and the Xenon had their merits, but Xenon's more traditional setup was closer to the multi-core environment of dual-core CPUs in 2005. However, the inherited narrow design structure of the PPE was lacking in non-VMX capabilities. Standard desktop-style CPUs like the Pentium 4, Athlon 64, and PowerPC 970 would feature a wider array of integer, load store, and branch predictor units owing to the general purpose nature that they were designed for. Not to mention they were out-of-order processors where the PPE was not. While an in-order processing design saves on transistor count, a missed branch prediction could result in severe performance penalties. Some optimizations helped to mitigate the issue, but developers still had to write clean code to prevent stalls. The one megabyte of L2 cache itself was really not that big for all three cores either. But with three PPE, Xenon had arguably a better balance of computing resources specifically for gaming, and consequently required fewer transistors than big multi-core PC parts. Even counting the one megabyte of L2 cache, Xenon came in at just 165 million transistors, about the same as a single core Athlon 64 and it clocked to 3.2 GHz with some measure of efficiency, unlike most early dual-core CPUs. For example, IBM's own PowerPC 970 MP, used in the final PowerPC Mac Pros, required liquid cooling just to hit 2.5 GHz. By the launch of the Xbox 360 in late 2005, big single-core processors were still the standard by which PC games were designed for, but the first multi-core games were starting to appear. These games were still entirely designed with the performance of one core in mind, but the arrival of the 360 would give developers the impetus to push the CPU side of games. Learning to cope with the narrow cores of the Xenon and learning to multi-thread in general would be a sore spot for many game studios, especially those used to the wide execution PC processors. Eventually developers would learn to design code that would spread amongst the three processing cores as needed, yet still took advantage of the Xenon's massive vector potential. Luckily for the Xbox 360 ecosystem, development would be nowhere near as fraught as the mass struggle on the PlayStation 3. The cell's singular PPE core would require using the SPEs and stream processing to maintain parity in many aspects. Ironically, the same stream processing techniques that were required on the PS3 would come to benefit the Xbox 360. Both Cell and Xenon could bypass their L2 caches and stream data directly to the VMX unit registers, and in the Cell's case, directly to its SPEs. From the VMX unit or SPE process, data could be immediately sent to the GPU, such as data for procedural generation. To the 360's advantage, it was never reliant on its CPU to maintain graphical parity like the PS3, which would have created issues in porting 360 games to the computer. Bare minimum, Xbox 360 games could be recompiled for the PC and brute forced without too much trouble as both platforms leveraged DirectX. Owing to Xenon's great vector performance, it's not all surprising that later multi-platform games on the PC needed a higher-end dual-core or a quad sometimes to run smoothly. Poor performance on PC was often chalked up to poor optimization, but a good part of that was thanks to Xenon competing well where it counted. 
devs were wringing out every bit of latent performance they could get from the system while dealing with the constraint of 512 megabytes of memory and the 240 GFLOP GPU. But late generation games like Titanfall, Battlefield 4, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, and most certainly Grand Theft Auto 5 truly showed what the already 8 year old 360 could do. These are all physics and animation heavy titles. 2014's Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, the final full release on past gen systems, still aimed for 60 FPS like it did with Call of Duty 2 9 years prior. Yet it looks substantially more impressive with more interactivity. A good number of early multi-platform PS3 games were victims of the Cell processor's exotic architecture while running perfectly fine on Xenon. Even with Cell assisting the RSX GPU in the PS3, games throughout the generation would often run better on the Microsoft machine, much thanks to the more simple environment for developing games. Only with PS3 exclusives does one see the Sony machine potentially elevate above the 360, and even then it's contestable. As per most consoles, the 360's components would undergo periodic shrieks in the manufacturing process, reducing component size and with it cost and power consumption. Finally, for the Xbox 360S, the Xenon and Xenos were integrated into a single die dubbed the XC GPU, effectively producing an APU not too dissimilar to AMD's own in the PC space. In a way, it was predicting where Silicon was heading for the next generation, spelling the end for independent graphics and central processing units and consoles. Prior to any die shrinks, by design Xenon was predicting where gaming was heading. Before, in the 6th generation, developers were experimenting with ragdoll physics, advanced particle effects, and animation rigging systems that moved with more lifelike intensity. Sony and Microsoft knew where things needed to improve the most, but Microsoft arguably had a better idea of how to achieve higher fidelity at a lower cost and was more friendly to developers. Both the Cell and Xenon stayed relevant as developers caught up to their potential over the life cycle, and in the end, Xenon better reflected future main processor design. One where enhanced vector and SIMD would continue to augment general processing cores and not the cell's asymmetric approach. Xenon was easier to program and optimize, and it showed in the past generation's games. To the cell's credit, however, its ideas were better reflected in the later GPU design and in the current GP GPU revolution that's underway. However, for its generation, the Xenon was what devs needed to forge big open worlds, high interactivity, and intriguing games that were not possible before its arrival. In many ways, the current generation is really all not that different, thanks in particular to the Xenon processor paving the way.